here. I'm Hannah Jennings, and I am a community organizer here at Tech in Motion. Over 10 years ago, Tech in Motion was founded by staffing and recruiting firm Motion Recruitment with the goal of bringing together the tech community to share ideas and inspire one another. We are constantly on the lookout for new event topics, passionate speakers, expert contributors, and more. So if you would like to get more involved within our community, feel free to check out the link in the chat. Today, we are thrilled to bring you an honest conversation on transforming your workplace with DEI strategies for 2024. From tools and strategies for an effective DEI program, to actionable steps for supporting employee mental health, to AI's impact on DEI, I can't wait to learn from our esteemed panelists how they are leading the charge in their own companies and see how, as a tech community, we can create a more inclusive future. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions throughout the entirety of today's event, be sure to pop them in the Q&A tab and our panelists will do their best to get to as many as possible. And we're also recording the session. So if you have to hop off early for any reason, we'll make sure you get a recording via email. Now, without further delay, I am pleased to introduce you to our host for today, Lindawe Davis. Lindawe is a multi-talented, multi-passionate founder, business creative, speaker, storyteller, and culture maker. She's a diversity, equity, inclusion leader and coach, and her daytime job in tech allows her to lead programming meant to educate and build awareness. Lindawe is the co-creator and co-host of a previously launched storytelling podcast called The Stranger Down the Hall. Her knack for sharing stories and providing space for others to do so is one of her defining gifts. We are so honored to have you back with us, Lindawe, so I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Hannah. I appreciate it. Um, I'm so happy to be back. I've been with Tech in Motion a few times um, for a few of these wonderful panels and discussions and talks. As Hannah said, my name is Lynn Dowie, but if you ever feel nervous, we meet in person. You can call me Lynn, no problem. Um, I work at Google during my daytime job, obviously working in this space, driving, leading, uh, occupying, all of the things, okay, uh, in this space of important work. Um, and of course, outside of that, I'm passionate about speaking and coaching and facilitation, education, um, spinning, biscuits, all the things. Um, and so I'm just super excited to be a little kickboxing too, you know, you got to get it out. Um, I'm super excited to be here. We have some really, really wonderful folks on this panel who are not only esteemed in their own right, but just ready to dive deeply into how we're going to keep moving this work forward in a way that's not um, posturing nor performative because we're done with that. We did all of that. We are done with that. There's no more coupons. OK, no more coupons on any of this work. We're just going to be telling the truth at this time. Um, today's discussion is really going to be anchored around workplace trends, strategies, talking about DEI within um, utilizing it in terms of AI as well and how that can be effective. And then, of course, um, mental health wellness, because we need that stability. We need that culture shift in terms of our minds and hearts when we're doing this work, but also just all across industries. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to start with our first panelist to introduce herself, um, Shana. Hello, thank you. I'm super excited to be here. My name is Shana, and I am the Senior Manager of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Communities at HubSpot. So that basically means I run more customer-facing, fan-facing communities that are identity-based and here to basically help shape and make your career path the way that you want it to be without all of the blockers, the issues, the systemic things that, you know, nobody discussed with us, but we're going to make sure that you get to reach what you want to do when you do it. Um, and so that's what I have been doing for the last few years. I'm based in Chicago and I use she, her pronouns. Thank you so much, Camille. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Camille, but you can call me Mia Ellis, and my pronouns are she, hers. And I am based in Pittsburgh, and my title is Global Head of DEI, and I work for Mendex, which is a Siemens company. So we're under their kind of 
digital information systems division. And I, um, I do quite a bit of things, uh, but basically a horizontal role across the whole organization. So I partner with um, the communications, product development, you name it. Um, I am embedded somewhere in there. Um, and I have been doing this work for quite some time uh, outside of work. I am a fourth year doctoral student students. So I am right at the end. So I'm looking forward to finishing that at the end of this year. Um, and I am just really excited to be here today and with everybody to get you some um, very helpful insights and in how to continue to drive this work. Thanks. Thank you. Glenn. Hello, hello. Uh, Glenn Newman here. I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I'm coming to you uh, from Atlanta, Southwest Atlanta. Um, I lead diversity, equity, inclusion, and employee experience uh, at Strava. If you don't know, Strava um, is a company we exist at the intersection of connected fitness and community. And we're working, we're on a mission to help people live their best active lives. So if you're following us, you saw in the news today that we just announced a partnership with the White House to help people be more active and to get moving. So, so check that out. Um, and then, you know, I think one of the things we we're gonna talk about are like our words to live by. Um, one of my words, one of my phrases to live by is if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. So <laughs> with that, I'll pass it back to you, Linda. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Mia, were you able to share an antidote that you like to live by or work by a mantra? Oh, no, I did not. I did not have one prepared. Um, but I do have it on my wall is to um, stay, stay curious and don't give directions to places you've never been. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's let's put that on the t-shirt uh, <laughs> uh shana what about you i know i was one of those that i also forgot but i'm pulling up my board because if you all did not know on instagram you can create little boards for yourself and you can save things that you love to listen to to experience um and just great reminders of things in life and so i have a whole board and it's basically called boss and it's a helpful reminder to myself that I am here at all times to be able to, like sometimes you forget, sometimes you forget and you need to have these reminders. And so I have a whole board of it, but um, one of the ones that I've been reminded of because I am in the space of building up a lot of personal things right now, I'm working on, my podcast is about to hit 200 episodes. It's called Bad Queers. We talk about breaking stereotypes in the LGBTQ plus community. I am growing out more of my speaking engagement. I had died off for a bit, but we're back, we're resurrected, we are here. Um, and one of the things that I have been reminded of is that no one is going to go out of their way to tell you this, but you can create anything if you, you want, if you make it a priority. So it's just taking my time to get things okay. done. Listen, we're kicking things off with all the sauce. Uh, I forgot to say this at the top when I introduced myself. My pronouns are she, her. And one of the things that I like to live by is that you can't stop me. It doesn't matter how many things you throw my way. It doesn't matter how many barriers are out there. I will find a way to get through the door or the window or, you know, a little crack in the sidewalk. It doesn't matter. Because um, <laughs> if I can do it once, I can do it several times over. So, um, Jumping right in with the first theme here, we're going to be talking about DEI workplace trends for 2024. And so, Glenn, I'm going to kick things off with you, digging a bit more into what types of trends um, are kind of top of mind for you and spaces, whether you want to touch on AI right now or around soft skill management, employee mm -hmm. support. What kinds of things do you think are top of mind, not only for your company, but also for industry, um, whether we're talking about tech, marketing, et cetera? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I would say the thing that is definitely top of mind for me and for our people leadership team right now, and likely other leaders internally, um, is return to office. So, um, so a lot of us will be returning to office starting in March. And so um, as I'm thinking about returning to office, I'm thinking like, how do we support our teammates, especially our underrepresented, you know, members uh, or teammates who are members of underrepresented groups? How do we, you know, um, try to mitigate, prevent microaggressions as much as possible, especially when so many of us have been protected from those while we have been working from home? How do we prevent people from, you know, we have our headphones on in the office and yet someone can't read a room and they still come up and just start talking to us, right? Like how do we have those protected safe spaces um, as you think about people who, who think differently and who work differently? So that's something that's definitely top of mind for me. I would say specifically as we think about 
some of the um, other DEI work um, that um, that we're prioritizing. It's definitely going to be growing and scaling uh, our ERGs, thinking about how do we continue to provide safe spaces for people who identify as while welcoming in um, others who want to learn and who want to grow into allies. Um, training is a big thing as well. How are we continuing to uh, enable managers to be inclusive leaders um, and to really understand how do you manage um, diverse teams? What does that look like? Um, and I would say the last thing that I'm really excited about is really um, we're going to have OKRs for the first time and more specifically um, all of our leadership team um, and then eventually the rest of our employees will have an OKR. Um, for those of you don't, who don't know, objectives, key results. Um, and I'm really excited about that because that will help add more of that stickiness around the commitment that we have um, to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, and thank you for grounding the, the um, acronym of OKRs because I know we've all met people who are just now getting to the OKR train, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the OKRs are the same thing as goals. What are your goals, mm -hmm. essentially? What it is it? What are you trying to accomplish, and how are you going to attach outcomes and or metrics, data points to that to ensure that you're actually moving towards that execution? Mia, I'm going to throw it over to you and talk to you a little bit about what kinds of trends are you hoping to kind of dig into, and what do you want to accomplish as a direct result of that concentration? Yeah, so um, very similar to Glenn, we're um, very focused on remote hybrid work. Um, my uh, company is completely distributed, so we are in all parts of the world and we do have some headquarter locations, but there are people like me who are completely remote. And so how do we preserve um, that culture and um, sense of belongingness as a distributed workforce? The other thing I would add is we're really focused on the intersection between um, DEI and digital transformation. So there's a lot of conversation around digital transformation. What does that mean? How come so many organizations aren't progressing as much as they would like? And um, the answer to that, surprise, surprise, is that there's so much focus on technology that the people and culture piece is what is overlooked, um, which is why it's so closely tied to DEI. So um, looking at how we prepare our leaders to be the new type of leaders that are necessary in this digital age, right? So there's a lot of much more complex problems that global organizations are fixed are being faced with that technology alone cannot solve. So they are needing to co-create with diverse groups of people to try to figure out how do we solve this? This isn't an ego thing of I'm the leader, I solve everything. It's being able to realize you have to surround yourself with diversity to be able to tackle these problems, being comfortable with ambiguity and not knowing all the answers um, and having this kind of iterative process of experimentation, learning, trying and doing things. So we're trying to get our, our leaders to understand how um, fostering a culture that prioritizes DEI better prepares them to do those things and to become those type of leaders to lead these digitally mature organizations. The second I would say, which is great, is that DEI from a global perspective is really picking up steam. Um, so there's a lot of new legislation that's coming out in different parts of the world that you didn't necessarily see before. Like in the Netherlands, I think there's a piece of legislation pending approval now that's going to be focusing on eliminating discrimination in the hiring process and employee recruitment. So a lot of, um, I think, co uh, companies and, and, excuse me, countries are having conversations around DEI that they weren't before. And so there is a much a growing interest from a global perspective of how do we embed these things because we do have these pieces of legislation that are going to be holding us accountable soon. Um, and so helping them to understand um, and shaping DEI in a way that's not so entrenched in US focused, um, but making it palatable and tangible to them, I'd say are the two main things for me added on to what Glenn said. Thank you, Mia. Um, first of all, you've called out several things here 
um, that are kind of leading us into our next uh, set of questions here around threading, you know, creating that very fabric ways of being a stronger muscle in how people are operating within the DEI space and understanding that once you have that thread, once you have that accountability factor, which is another attribute, particularly for our people that are in uh, leadership roles um, who have positionality. Uh, Shana, I want to throw it over to you and talk a little bit about um, what do we want to include with some of this programming? What do we want to include with some of these strategies? What What is going to be very key for people? Is it just the threading? Is it just accountability? Is it just our leaders? Where do you see us kind of moving and shifting and what's going to be necessary in order for us to ensure that the company's DNA is moving and shifting and growing? Yeah, thank you for that. Um... I think the number one thing that we really have to look into and remind ourselves and remind our leaders is that we are no longer in 2020. Mm -mm. It, it's been four years. It's been a whole high school time that we have been here. And if you think of what life was like when you were a freshman in high school all the way up to when you were a senior, you're a whole different person. Mm -hmm. You've gone through a lot of changes. And I think companies just need to remember that because a lot of companies are still operating as if it is 2020 and 2021, which we can no longer do. Work looks different. It feels different. We're either at home or hybrid. Some folks are back in the office. So when I say that we can't operate like it's 2020 or 2021, I mean that high amount of events, food, um, only celebrating the holidays that are on the calendar are no longer enough. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of companies have really just skirted by on those things. And now employees are starting to ask for more of that accountability. They're asking for leadership to do those things. So when you were saying, can it just be the one thing? It can't. It has to be something that is actually woven with different pieces into the DNA. And I love what Mia was saying as well, where it's like, we also have to be okay with being uncomfortable. I think we jumped into the DEI ship so quickly that everybody was like, yes, diversity. Okay, wait, we got all these people in our photos now. We're good, right? We we had these holidays now, right? We're good. Like we've we've done the work, and no, the asks are different. Um, so we can't just start initiatives after a disaster, an attack, a murder has happened anymore. Um, we have to have long term strategies that are implemented. We have to have buy in from leadership down. Um, feedback from employees needs to be constant. Um, one area that I can say that we're shifting in HubSpot is working on the pathway to leadership. We've had a lot of those conversations. A number that consistently and always stands with me is that Black women are representative of 0.3% of tech executives. 0.3%. We, we, we can't even round up with the amount of Black women that are in tech executive positions. So we're working on having sponsorship programs. We're improving mentorship programs. Um, the program that I work with externally, we're doing the same thing. We're helping our customers get to that point in their careers. We're launching our mentorship programs. We're going to have a coaching program. Um, are one of those ways, because we've given feedback to say, we want to see ourselves in these positions. And that's something where it's like you're getting that feedback and putting it into action. But it's just not one way. And I think we have to move away from trying to have a party planner run your DEI program. So we're spot on, spot on with that. Um, I think that this business of being on stage, right? What I've learned working in this space, and I imagine all of you have seen this as well. There's a lot of folks who like to be on stage, raise a hand, yes, I'm going to come up and say this templated response. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to say things like, oh, yes, I have been interested in DEI for 20 years, forgetting that the acronym wasn't really readily available 25 years ago. So when, you know, I want to throw it over to you and have you add a little bit more color and context to partnerships, right? You all are working with some stronger um, brands in this way. You just got a partnership going uh, that could be quite um, effective, right, in this space in terms of wellness as well. And so what kinds of things do you think are um, important and essential in order to engage these initiatives in a much more effective manner, but also in a more disruptive manner as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll touch on kind of the partnerships piece as well as some of the um, like 
some of the core components from my perspective, like what, of what you need for to have a strong DEI program. So I'll just touch on some of those foundationally. Leadership commitment. We've been talking about that. For me, that means, hey, are your most senior leaders, have they verbally, vocally, publicly stated that diversity, equity, inclusion is a commitment? Um, part two of that, why is it important, right? Not just for the business, um, but for them personally. Like, why does this work matter to them? When they're out on the weekends with their families, what are they talking about around DEI and why is that important? The second thing is going to be accountability, right? So I feel like to have a commitment without accountability, you're not really doing the work. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I think the other thing, quite frankly, is also really understanding both the um, organizational readiness and the leadership readiness, right? Because I have learned probably the hard way that I, like, there are a lot of DEI best practices I would love to bring to organizations. And sometimes, quite frankly, the organization and the leadership team is just not ready. Um, like, And that is okay, but I think for me personally, it took me a long time to get to that place of, um, of living in reality, right? Um, I think the, the other thing that's really important is um, prioritization, right? You can't do everything as much as I would love to boil the ocean. Um, and that is actually not possible. So how am I gonna heat things up a little bit, right? Um, to really positively impact people's lives and livelihoods. Um, and then I think the other thing that, I, that I've learned that is really helpful and important um, in, in doing this work is change management. Change management done really well. And of course the, um, the associated and partnering communications. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, what are the components of a strong DEI program? Um, and I think going back to the partnerships, like as we think about these partnerships, it's definitely alignment, right? Like do these organizations um, align with our mission, vision, and values, um, specifically that value around anti-racism and the commitment to, to diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? So I think that's the first, that's the first place. Um, and then of course, we're thinking, um, do the missions, like, you know, I talked about our mission to um, help people live their best active lives. And then I talked about kind of this, this White House partnership. Well, there's mission alignment there, right? So I think the other thing is just making sure that there's uh, mission alignment uh, as well. Absolutely. Mission alignment, accountability from our leaders, intentionality. These are super key things. Mia, you want to add one or two other things to this? when you're thinking about planning and implementing, is there something that we've missed off this list of things to do? Um, I think, and I love that you said change management because that's what my one of my masters is in. And I think that's really, really helped me in doing this work, Glenn. So before I answer, I'll say that. Thanks for the little shout out there. But um, I would say that, uh, particularly from a, a, as I mentioned, from a global perspective, uh, I think, um, Finding, finding more creative ways to collect data about uh, from your employees. So I know that we personally have to be very um, cognizant of different data privacy laws from a global perspective, and it makes it a bit more challenging to find out information about who's in the organization, how are they feeling, how are they doing, because from a cultural perspective, it's just not the norm um, for some parts of the world. And so I think just really figuring out, and I, I, I know that Google is probably one of the ones that I know have been able to do it because I read your diversity report and it was like the first one I saw that was able to actually go and find probably the most in depth about their employees from a global perspective. Um, and I think that that's been very, very top of mind of keeping that in mind because I think we all are working from a global perspective now. And so, ensuring that you know how to collect this data in creative ways. And the other one is just understanding that your DEI strategy is going to have to adjust um, and based off of that local region of where your employees are located and, and placing that as a priority. That's one more thing I would add. I appreciate that, Mia. Yeah. Um, you know, you've introduced this topic of data and so right as we are thinking about data, we can shift our mindset into AI, we can shift our mindset into metrics-based thinking and moving. And so, you know, thinking about AI's impact on DEI, thinking about how to leverage data and the tools within this lexicon of the conversation, what might be 
what is most significant and or challenging when trying to pull data, right? You mentioned privacy obviously is one of them, but how can we use data analytic tools um, within this space to really kind of propel us forward? Um, so that's things like, that's just aside from demographics. We're not just talking about racial demographics, age demographics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're talking about things like, uh, how often people are promoted. We're talking about um, when a person was promoted versus uh, how long they've been in the role, right? So drilling down on some of those things, is the pathway significant enough for said person when they came to the company? Are they under leveled? You know, right. how exactly can we use data analytics tools and where do you all see, Glenn, I'll start with you. Where do you all see some of those significant kind of like opportunities and challenges in doing so? Yeah, that's a, I love that you called out the promotion piece uh, and you and you double clicked into that a little bit. Um, so at a high level, I'm always looking at like, am I seeing differences? So I will just start with, am I seeing differences? Not am I seeing statistically significant differences, but mm -hmm. am I seeing differences in um, like who we hire across, you know, for um, across like gender and race, ethnicity, who we promote, who attrits, like who's leaving the organization. Um, so I'm looking at those kinds of things as well as our overall um, like demographic trends and representation trends overall. So I love the fact that, you know, there have been so many tools that have been popping up lately to really help um, make this work less manual so that the tool is analyzing the data and showing us, um, for example, the statistically significant differences so that we can help focus um, on like interventions and so like, for example, if, we, if we're seeing that we're disproportionately losing women in engineering, and that's just, you know, illustrative, then, um, you know, why is that? And then we can um, double click into that, have some conversations, some listening sessions, um, and understand what are employees' experiences. So I think there are a lot of tools that have been popping up, I'll probably say in like the last three years, that really help provide um, that level of data and analytics. Um, so I think that's, um, and we, we are likely to see more of those. I will probably say, and you all can kind of back me up on this, even like five years ago, there weren't, you know, a number of tools um, in this space. And now there are so many that are leveraging um, AI, as well as, again, just kind of like core, um, you know, statistical uh, analyses. Thank you so much, Glenn. And I want to kind of drill a little bit more into some of the simpler things that could be done. Um, Glenn, I'll throw it back to you and then Mia and uh, Shana, I'd love your thought process on this, but do you all think that focus groups and surveying is still quite useful? Oh, absolutely. Like for example, on our um, annual engagement survey, there's a, there are questions around belonging, right? So I'm definitely looking at that. I'm looking at specifically, and I'm glad you mentioned that, I'm looking specifically to see, are we seeing differences in um, the belonging score by, again, certain demographics, by certain uh, tenure levels, right? Um, by certain levels within the organization, by location. Um, so we're definitely looking at um, at that information. And then I'm also looking at things like, for example, who are members of ERGs who are not members of ERGs. I mean, we're looking at data. Um, we also do a lot of um, state interviews. We call them Stravaversary interviews, but we do state interviews so we can really understand um, the level and the type of support that employees are getting. And then like, there's a good question on there to ask, hey, what's, what's one thing you're not doing that you wanna be doing? That question mm -hmm. gives us su like, such really good data. Um, so again, that qualitative data um, is really helpful. So I appreciate you kind of prompting uh, that question. No problem. I can, I can oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, would, I would agree with Glenn. I think it's very helpful. I can give an example for myself that, um, you know, we have a gender equity program and trying to get more women into leadership and um, where focus groups really helped where, you know, we were offering these positions and women employees weren't jumping for them. And so the focus groups really helped us to understand what were those additional barriers that weren't initially considered and things that came out that you wouldn't even think of. Like people are like, oh, you know, I actually want to work part time and share a leadership role with someone. Or when leadership meetings happen at 8 a.m. every day, I can't go to those meetings. And so there was a lot of really great rich um, data that we were able to pull from those focus groups that I, I think um, even went outside of what we were even considering might be barriers um, to this specific group of people. So I'm I'm definitely on board for surveys and, and um, focus groups still being very useful. I love that. Shana. 
Yeah, so I know that we have them regularly within HubSpot, but I also want to point out that even with like our customers or folks who are fans of our businesses, also bringing them into the conversation too. So being able to regularly survey them, see how we're doing, see if they are mm -hmm. benefiting from the tools that we're providing, because that could also impact what we're doing internally as a business, what we could be doing internally as employees and how we can provide that change in support. It could be a low hanging fruit that we completely missed, but every single one of our customers or fans say is either a problem or something that excites them. And it can give us that opportunity to lean in to those spaces to be able to kind of either solve the problem or amplify the thing that folks are truly loving. So I think the survey aspect of it, it's, it's not gone away by any means. Yes, AI is coming in and yes, it's allowing us to read and do things faster, but I think people's voices will always and continue to be first. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm definitely a fan of a survey, you know, anything that ranges from a good 60 seconds to two to three minutes, like, you know, there's no excuses. Um, you know, we oftentimes hear from people, oh, you know, these things take too long, but literally it takes less time to do the survey than it would to order yourself a tea or coffee at Starbucks. Okay. So, you know, and this is something that's definitely worthwhile and that we need to continue to keep building. That coffee is only going to be good for 30 minutes, maybe, if that. Um, so throwing it back over to you, Mia, you know, dig a little bit more into some of the um, challenges and or triumphs that BIPOC um, community folks um, maybe faced with with the rise of AI. Um, we know that talking about AI, one of the things that I've been diving a little bit deeper into for myself is really understanding the language. A lot of times when new things are introduced to the world or to various communities, people don't have access to context, right? Which means when you don't have access to context, that builds a level of fear. When you have fear for something, you are against it. It's the same thing. It's one of those um, defining um, traits of racism. It's one of those defining traits of systematic racism, socioeconomic downfall of black and brown people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So where do you see some of those challenges and triumphs that uh, BIPOC community folks may be facing with the rise of AI? Yeah, so I think we've already talked about how AI can be very helpful um, in ways of identifying, not even just in the hiring process, but performance, evaluation, promotions, all of that um, can be extremely helpful. But the other side of that is that um, tech technology in general can be very helpful in mitigating bias, but if there is not a critical component um, built into the design and development of it, it can reinforce a lot of the inequities and exacerbating it pretty much um, the existing, uh, excuse me, inequities that we have. So there's already ample evidence that um, there's been a lot of discriminatory harm caused by AI tools in various for marginalized groups in various industries, whether it's housing, the workplace, education, the financial system, the prison system, anything, even just determining whether or not somebody is eligible for tenure. So the, the issue is, I would say, is that um, often bias, and we were talking about data, it, it it's often embedded in the outcomes that the AI is asked to predict. So um, bias is in the data used to train the AI. So the data that's often discriminatory already on its face is what's being put out and can be extremely harm harmful to marginalized groups of people. So if that's not taken into account when it's being developed and designed, which is why, again, when we talk about digital transformation and the importance of diversity and the importance of having people who can intercede from that standpoint so that the AI is not it's not smart enough <laughs> to um, not be able to reinforce the systems of, of oppression that already exist. So I would say that's that's the major challenge, but I, I agree with the point that you brought up too, which is um, when these things are introduced, it's not taught to everyone. So even in, within the workplace, like if you don't know what something is, or if you're not working directly on it as a part of your work, you're just left on the outskirts. And then people just start making up stuff in their mind in terms of what that it's going to replace my job, it's going to replace me, um, and, and start to become resistant to it. So I think that's an extremely important step to take of 
you know, whether someone's in a technical role or not, you should be able to give some tangible information of what it is and how it's beneficial and how it should be used properly. That last point, Mia, is um, very loud, right? There should be tangible information both being given and uh, readily available for people to tether themselves to. Um, I think as we think about AI, we think about uh, the equity space, the DEI ecosystem overall, there's so many layers, so many attachments, so many learnings. There's, you've got this historical background um, of all communities that you also have to consider here. Um, I want to dive us into well-being and, and um, just having balance, right? Both in your life, in your business life, your professional life, but when you walk into the doors of your professional space, um, there really should be some sort of programming or pathway for people to feel like they can actually just take time for themselves. So Mia, I'm going to start back with you. What kinds of practical strategies right, can be created um, to support a culture that is much more interested in a person's well-being than just making money? I'll keep it like that. So I think the first thing when I hear this question is is um, is to understand the importance that well-being and mental health isn't solely the responsibility of the employee. So I hear that a lot, a lot of frustration with organizations that are putting out tools like the Calm app and the self-affirmation. And what it's not paying attention to is that the major stressor and the primary stressor of the burnout is the environment <laughs> or maybe the person that they're directly reporting to. And so I can I can use these tools and take the individual responsibility, but I'm just putting that's only a temporary fix until I'm putting myself right back into that toxic environment. So culture is a very important part here. Um, how leaders are cultivating um, their team spaces and workplaces to enable people to do their best work and to be in the right mindset. So I, I think being able to kind of deconstruct things that people are tired of, you know, they, they don't want to be working in these perfectionist cultures where they're being dehumanized or demeaned on a daily basis. Um, I think normalizing diversity and moving away from this, there's only one right way to do this. And if you don't conform to this, you're, you're not considered a valuable member on this team and you're just constantly having to prove yourself. Um, I think the other thing too is to whatever resources there are to be transparent about them, especially when you have a very large organization and people are all over the place. They don't know where to start or where to go. Um, the other thing I would say is that it helps to remove the stigma of people having to reach out and say, I have this, you know, I have this condition or I'm going through this, whether it's substance use or mental health or anything, it's just there for them proactively to reach out to. So I try to encourage people to just be very clear about what's available so people don't have to be put in the position to ask. Um, and then the other I would say is, is practicing inclusive language. I don't think people realize how demeaning it can be when, when they're saying things just kind of casually about mental illness or substance use or anything that somebody might be going through. Um, so inclusive language and the language we use with each other uh, is another aspect. So I took this a little bit a different route. So I wasn't necessarily talking about like benefits, but these are things that I think are essential tenants to creating um, a work vi work environment in place where people can prioritize their mental health. Uh, spot on, Mia. I, it, there are a couple of things that you landed on. One of those things, just calling this out and bringing it really forward, which is there is no recipe to do this work. You have to be willing, though. You have to be willing and you have to be available. You have to be open. Um, but very, very key, listening and hearing people and their needs. These are the things that can kind of contribute to how you can improve a culture. Uh, Shana, would you agree um, that it is truly on a leader? At least part of it is, right? Because these are p people that are in positions, they have positionality. Um, what kinds of things can leaders be doing to create that sustainability, to create that uh, culture of wellness? Yeah, it, it truly is an example of a leader, is how I would phrase it. Mm -hmm. 
we can have all of these tools, we can have all of these benefits, you know, tech companies put them out there in an array of ways that you forget how many benefits you may even have while working there. But if your leader isn't being the example of what that looks like, isn't being the person that is open and understanding, displaying the examples of what that looks like, like you as a leader, and all of us are leaders on this, like we have to be visible about our decisions, especially because we are in a leadership role. I want people to understand how seriously they have to take an employee's roadmap within a company is also at the expense of a good leader that is going to be there advocating for you and supporting you and understanding what's going on. So if you do have someone who is experiencing that, I mentioned earlier where it shouldn't be like a reactive thing. Like when we were talking about, um, we shouldn't build these initiatives off of the news. We shouldn't be reacting to the news. It's the same thing internally. We shouldn't be reacting based off of somebody maybe having um, mental health issues or family issues or are dealing with seasonal depression and things like that. We should be proactive in what we're doing. Um, that includes speaking out loud about the fact that maybe you are using some of these tools. You're like, wow, I just got out of a really great therapy session using um, my Calm app or any other app that <laughs> exists um, for stuff. We use Modern Health um, and being able to say like, yeah, I just had my session with that. Or if you notice a team member that is having issues being like, hey, do you remember that we have like this tool, this tool, and this tool? I feel like it might be helpful for you. How about you block off some of your calendar on this day and take the time to kind of go and explore it and review it. And if you have any questions that you're comfortable asking me, I'm happy to answer or be sure that I find the answers as you need. Being those examples of using that, I am very loud when I'm like, I am taking time off. Guess what I'm doing? I'm about to go and have a good time. You don't have to know all the details, but I am just taking time off. Or if you're like, you know what, y'all? I woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. I'm going to have to start a few hours late, or I'm just going to have to take today and make it a me day. It is just feeling off. Um, the same if you're getting partway through your day and you're like, I just don't feel great. Cool. Let me know. Block off your calendar. I'm here for you. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Is there anything you need me to cover? And it's being able to have those moments of human that I think we just forget whenever we get into corporate settings. It's always deliver and high performance culture and let's reach the next level and let's do all these things. As leaders, it is our opportunity to remember that like the people we are working with are people and mm -hmm. we have to be able to just kind of like move forward in like a life approach. So allowing people to manage their schedule. Some people work better in the morning. Some people work better in the afternoon. Some folks want to get on later in the evening. Cool. Set the expectations that like we need you on for at least these hours so we can have meetings and do our thing. But if that works best for you, great. Um, making moments for that, like starting your team meeting. I always start off with an icebreaker that are just random, um, but we have really good discussions about them. Um, one of my teammates, I asked them to do the question last week and we incorporate them into that space. And they started a really great conversation that we can just start our team meetings with for like 10 minutes just to like relax and not worry that they're about to get a bunch of new deadlines and updates and things that they have to turn in. Um, creating those safe spaces. I was like, ERGs are great, but doing it on your team because that's who you're engaging with the most. Um, being able to continue to engage in training and programming and conversations. We still host a lot of programming. Um, I will let my team know like, hey, I'm attending this programming. Have you seen the programming for this month? I was like, Black History Month. Obviously, we did programming. I'm like, hey, I'm attending this event and this event. Who else is attending with me? Um, and seeing how people do that. But on the grander scheme, you know, thinking about flexible work, thinking on a global um, lens, understanding that some of these countries give different laws and permissions, especially around like maternity leave. And, you know, summer in Europe, you don't see any of your teammates. And you're just like, wow, I want to live that life. I want to know what these things are. But you have to also be understanding about that. Because as a US lens, sometimes it does get frustrating because you're like, I need this person, but also they're taking their time off. And I have to enjoy that. And I'm gonna have to be better next time around. Um, so it's a lot of speaking out loud about those things, but also just recognizing the different opportunities to be human. I appreciate that, Shana. I um, appreciate that. You're absolutely spot on um, because in other spaces across the globe, they absolutely seem to have a concentration point on caring about the employee. Okay. Um, I want to get us to a wrap up place before we start taking questions for the audience. Glenn, close us out with ERGs. 
right? I know we've mentioned ERGs throughout the conversation today. We've talked a lot about um, a wellness. We've talked about data. We've talked about uh, creating strategy and really being in a place of partnership and also just being the driver and owner of a lot of these things. But when it comes to ERGs, these are um, in communities of support. Right. Community support are going to be saving graces for so many people in professional spaces. And so give us one or two thoughts around how orgs can actually think about ERGs if they don't already have one, mm -hmm. who might be sources for them to go to if they don't have one. And if they already have an ERG, what could they be doing right now to strengthen uh, the direction in which they're moving their ERG? Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm definitely going to start at the top. The leadership buy-in. If you want to start an ERG program, make sure you have leadership buy-in. Um, and that's just not verbal. That is, you know, leaders are going to make an, an active effort and a commitment to engage with ERG leaders, to engage with the community. So definitely leadership buy-in. Um, the other thing, education. Like when I started at Strava, I realized that there were so many people who did not understand what ERGs were. So I, I spent a lot of time really bringing people along that journey. And that goes back to the communication and the change management. Bringing people along and doing that work at the beginning is key because it helps to ensure the success of your programs. And it also helps you get in front of um, any like questions or quite frankly, people who are trying to slow down your, your progress, right? Um, and then I think the a, a really, really, really big thing that a lot of companies have started to do more recently is compensate, reward, pay your ERG leaders. Um, this work is emotionally draining, taxing, fill in the blanks, all the things. So really make sure that you're rewarding and have some sort of structure to reward your ERG leaders, the people who are leading this work, um, in addition to their day jobs, right, or alongside their day jobs. So those are some things that I would definitely um, encourage. Um, and then, of course, you're thinking about all of like the structure, the process, the FAQs, like be really intentional with all of those things as you're thinking about establishing um, an ERG program. And then maybe I'll wrap with um, as you're maturing your ERG program, think about, of course, goals. What are they um, setting out to do? We talked about OKRs earlier. Um, and of course, always think about how you're um, developing your ERG leaders. So how are you growing and developing them? How are you, again, rewarding them, not just monetarily, but through experiences? Do they have access to senior leaders? Do they have access to networking, speaking, conferences, uh, et cetera? How are you making that uh, like a novel experience that more people will want to um, take part in? Thank you, Glenn. Appreciate that. Um, before we jump into questions here, I want to have each one of you kind of give a one-liner around what would it look like in an ideal environment where DEI was part of the fabric? We didn't have to call it out in such a loud manner because it's already a part of the very fabric and threading of how a team, an organization, a company, leaders are working. Can you each one of us hit us with a sentence of what that might sound like and or look like? Um, and you know what, Shana, I'm going to start with you. It would look like I could take me anywhere and everywhere, mm. but be able to take the space to relax for me. Okay. Okay. Mia. Oh, man, I was going to go that route, but I think I, um, to me, it would be um, just kind of the normalization of difference. Like it would just be an expectation, just like we have that expectation of music and food and nature being different and adding to our lives, um, I we would behave in that same way as we interact with one another and how we go about our work. And maybe this is longer than one sentence, sorry. <laughs> but um, I think that it would be where every professional, regardless of what department they are in, realizes that they cannot be good at or excel in their job without this also being uh, a skill set. So. I'll take it. We'll take it. <laughs> Glenn? Um, for me, um, you used, you've used the word positionality a lot. Um, so I'm going to kind of pull on that thread a little bit. So people, um, what it would look like for me is people would make an active, consistent effort to use their power and privilege to positively impact people's lives and livelihoods. Better speak it. 
Glenn, with two <laughs> ends. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> for me, it would be the moment that someone tells you that something is happening to them that is quite adverse, that you take the initiative to believe them first and take immediate steps to ensure that you not only retain them, that you also resolve the matter that they've brought to your attention. So with that, we're going to shift into some live audience questions. Uh, thank you so much, wonderful Hannah, for dropping these questions into the document here. And I will try to get these individuals' names uh, correct. OK, don't hold it against me. Um, how are you measuring success or progress with uh, DEI initiatives? This question comes from Chris Johnson. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, Shana, Mia, Glenn, anyone want to take this question? Can you repeat the question again? <laughs> yeah. Okay. How, are you, how are you measuring success or progress with the DEI initiatives? Um, well, I think there's multiple ways <laughs> that we do this. Um, so I think we talked a little bit about this already in terms of the way that we collect data on an ongoing basis. So we, um, I like to say we're data informed, not data driven <laughs> for the very reasons that we mentioned about bias sneaking its way in. But we do use and collect data as much as we can. Sometimes in a global way, we have to become very creative in how we um, gather it to collect to see how people are doing. But um, I think we use surveys, we use focus groups. Um, we use one-on-one -on -one interviews, everyday interactions. We use our ERGs. Um, all of these things work in tandem to inform and to see how we're progressing and how we're doing. Um, and the same thing in, in terms of we're tracking people's life cycles. So when they join us or in the recruitment process to when they're leaving us um, to know and track through that pipeline as well. Thank you so much, Mia. Um, Going into our second question here, are you finding that firms are defining diversity by function and role or by looking at staff as a whole? I have found that managers embrace DEI when it is most focused on their team. Um, Shana, thoughts here on this one? Oh, that's interesting on the focus on the teams. I think overall, if that's what you're seeing, I think it's at the result of the fact that there are resources available for managers to be able to take those directly to their team and be able to kind of like make impact there. Um, I also believe that at larger companies, it is a lot harder because there are so many people and there's so many different departments and you kind of end up in like a silo um, when it comes to what those DEI and B efforts look like. And so I think that, again, goes back to what it looks like for leadership um, and how they are actually defining diversity. I don't think it's really by function or role, but I do think it makes a bigger impact on certain functions and roles. So if you're, for example, if you're looking at a marketing team or a people operations team, stereotypically, those are going to be the teams that are really moving forward with a lot of the DEI and B efforts where you may not be hearing those same conversations or getting that same energy from a product team or an engineering team. Um, that is the stereotype. That is not how every company is, but it does seem like that is where um, a lot of the pushback happens. So I think that's kind of where the breakdown ends up. But if you are consistent across the board amongst your leadership, um, then it makes it a lot easier for it to be able to not be by function or role and actually impact the entire company. Yeah. So I can, go ahead. Clint. No, I was going to say I can chime in. I'm I'm, I'm thinking um, Matt asking the question is thinking like for example, you can have a manager who says, "Hey, we don't have anyone with AI skills on the team, and that's something that we need to diversify our team." Or you can have a manager that says, "Hey, I have a pretty homogenous team, and I need to diversify the team." I think that's my, that might have been where the question is going. I will say I think it's. Um, I'm going to use the word easier for managers um, to think about the, the former versus the latter, right? They, they are more comfortable having a conversation that says, hey, we don't have someone on the team that has really great project management skills. That's something that we need, right? They are much less comfortable saying, we ain't got no Black people on the team and we need to make sure we have a representative team, right? So um, my thoughts are you need both, right? Um, and then I also think about like, if I'm coaching hiring managers, like, where do you have opportunities? Like my, my question to them when they ask me like, Glenn, what should I do? Where do you have opportunities for growth, for development? Where do you have gaps? Um, so that's that's my approach. 
Thank you, Glenn. Um, I, <laughs> you've just landed, then thank you for the question, Matt. We appreciate it. You've just landed something here that made me think about this conversation that's been ongoing when it comes to DEI work, which is um, how do we have true practitioners in this space? So for example, everybody on this phone call is a practitioner in their own right, but also has an expertise in various areas, if not holistically. And so I want to call this out for everyone that's in attendance for this, that you absolutely need to have people uh, taking the conversation further in roles within the DEI space to, in order to ensure that the work is being driven and executed and people are being held accountable. So I just want to make sure we call that out because I think there might be some confusion, uh, you know, from folks that I have seen across the board, various industries, uh, spaces that I often visit um, where people don't seem to have clarity around that. And the second attachment to that is just always making sure you have budget. You cannot do this work without the budget. Um, so just want to throw that out there for everyone as well. Appreciate your response, um, Shana and Glenn, on this question. Next question here um, from Marsha. Thank you, Marsha Hutchinson. Um, are you planning to train LLMs with the historical DEI data that you have collected? And if so, what outcomes from Gen AI are you hoping to experience? Mia, can I throw this question over to you? I, I'm not, what is LLM? I'm not familiar with. Well, let's see. <laughs> I was wondering if it was like line leaders, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> like, you know, I'm so going to need the repeat on that question. <laughs> <laughs> I took the LLM exactly like that. I'm like, okay, I think they might be talking about managers, but hold oh, on. Oh, I found it. I did the Googles. I did okay. the Googles. <laughs> so it's, it's a large language. Large <laughs> language model. Large ah, language thank you, Kevin. A type of, a type of okay. AI program that can recognize and generate tests, among other tasks. Okay. Mm. So what's the other, what's the question again? I'm sorry with it. It's I okay. just got stuck on the LLM part. It's okay. It's okay. Are you planning to train? LLMs with the historical DEI data you have collected? And if so, what outcomes from Gen AI are you hoping to experience? Um, I mean, I, I can't say that I'm, my organization is that far ahead. So I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this question in regards to that. I, I can say that from a Mendex standpoint, I am in an inaugural role. So I'm the first of its kind um, in Mendex. So we're, as an organization under the Siemens umbrella, um, not there yet. So in terms of utilizing that. So I don't know if I would necessarily be able to say I'm doing it right now. I would like to be able to get to that point. Um, but uh, like I said, I, I would... I would say from my standpoint, we're not there yet. So I don't want to, if anybody else wants to hop in and take this question, but yeah, my org isn't there at that point yet. Yeah. From what I've seen um, from, you know, many of the big five companies um, in general, right. Particularly in the tech space, um, how Bard and chat DTP and chat GPT, um, Etc. Gemini, etc. have all been developed. You know, if you remember when those things were being introduced, they were asking for subsets of people to test uh, lots of um, those platforms and tools to ensure that lingo, language, etc. Uh, were in a much more, how do I say, inclusive uh, space. Um, and I'm pretty sure that that's going to always be ongoing because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if you have people that are on the machine learning side, these people need to also be informed um, around culture, around inclusiveness, around bias, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say we can all keep our eye on this kind of thing. But if your company is not already testing in this way, I imagine this is something that can be introduced, um, you know, whether you're at the lower level or the higher level, because it's going to be necessary regardless. Yeah. To add mm -hmm. a quick piece to this, right. I can also agree that my company is like in in the beginning stages of looking into this, but it's also not only just around the team of people who are going to be doing this, but around uh, breaking down like data bias when it comes yeah. into this space as well and making sure that the machine isn't just picking up on those internal biases. And I think there is a long way to go. Everything's moving so fast with AI, but I think there is a long way to go when it comes to um, some of the data bias and acknowledging that 
the data that has to be fed into these systems has to be unbiased in nature, but we're still working with humans who are feeding machines who are also biased. So there's a piece in there that we got to fix. I know we haven't fixed it yet, but just also with that, um, I know that's a big discussion around what companies are feeding it when it comes to that data, because it's so quickly leaning on the biases and we all know which way those biases lean. So listen, and we need to get out the lean. Okay. Um, with that being said, I want to thank Mia, Glenn with two N's, Shana <laughs> for showing up today. Okay. Colorful, delicious and context and insights and feedback. Um, I want to thank everyone that attended um, with this discussion. And we're so thankful that, to be here to offer anything that we can in this area. And then some, Hannah, I see you just jumped back on screen. So I'm going to throw it back to you. All right, that's a wrap on such an insightful discussion. Thank you to everyone who attended and a huge thank you to our panel for sharing your experiences and knowledge on this very important topic. Um, we invite you all to tune in to our upcoming event, Leaders and Innovators, Women Shaping the Tech Industry on March 14th. This discussion will cover breaking into the tech industry, finding mentorship and community and building your professional network. Be sure to follow along with us on socials to be the first to know about our upcoming events. But once again, thank you all for attending and we look forward to seeing you next time.